Good morning, everyone. Come on in. My original intent today was to jump into chapter, I think it's 43, the elementary particles chapter, but I decided I'm not going to do that, I, uh, especially since I cut you out short on Friday. I thought I'd work some problems from chapter 15, maybe hopefully uh, let y'all see some of the ins and outs a little better than just reading the examples on your own. And we only got one day this week because, you know, uh, Thanksgiving uh, holiday starts Wednesday, so we know, have no classes on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And of course, Saturday and Sunday were off as well. So I won't see you again for a week from today. So I thought this would be a better way to close out the week. And uh, I know students in general, the more problems they see, the more they feel like they're better equipped. I was going to make some videos this weekend, uh, but we had a lot of other things going on. So I ended up just uh, waiting and doing it today. So hopefully this will work out. Does anybody have any questions before we get started? I'm actually in the process of pulling up my e-text. You guys uh, might want to either bring out your book or take out your uh, e-text from your mastering website if you get the bandwidth and all that good stuff. Uh, just because I'm going to refer to problems in the end of the chapter so you can see how to do them. And, and these are just some typical type problems that you'd be expected to be able to solve. Uh, and then I, I want you and uh, want you to be able to solve and understand. And, you know, a lot of the problem I think you you've probably already run into is you listen to me and it sounds like everything is pretty straightforward. You watch me start solve problems and everything looks pretty straightforward, but then you try to do a problem and it's really hard to get started. So uh, that's more of uh, not completely internalizing what's going on. So you want to try while you're doing your reading as well as while you're doing a, a lecture, you want to try to interactively uh, or you want to interact with your brain and the material while the material is being presented so that you can sort of predict what's going to happen, guess what's going to happen, correct yourself when it doesn't happen, or pat yourself on the back when it does happen. That, that might help you a little bit, but anyways. So what I'm going to try to do is pull up a particular problem. I'm going to turn to page uh, 619. Yeah, I'm going to turn to page 619. As soon, as soon as I discover how to turn to a page on this here document. Hmm. Did you ask how to turn to the page? That's what I'm going to do is turn to page 619. If y'all have the book available to you, either by uh, ebook or by having a copy next to you, that would be great. The way that I do it is I just look at the table of contents and look to the closest part that I want to go to. Yeah. And then I just like search up the chapter. Yeah, that's what I ended up doing too, because I was looking for the, the, the layout's different than it used to be. Uh, but yeah, I went to chapter 15 and then clicked on problems, and that brought me to some page whose number shall remain nameless evidently <laughs> for 18. <laughs> okay, that's where it brought me. Uh, so it's pretty close. I want the next page is 419. I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen when I get there. The, the only reason why I didn't really want to do this up for you guys to look at is because you know this is going up on YouTube and they uh, they might get mad at me for copyright violation and that sort of thing. So uh, I'm gonna work a problem like either 22 or 23, something like that. Let me see what 20, I think 24 would be a better one. Yeah, 24 is a little bit more robust, ask more things. So let me go ahead and uh, share screen for just a second so you guys can see what that is. So can everybody see this problem? A transverse traveling wave on a cord is represented by D equals 0.22 sine 5.6x plus 34t, where d and x are in meters and t is in seconds. For this wave, determine a the wavelength, b the frequency, c the velocity, magnitude, and direction, uh, d the amplitude, and e maximum and minimum speeds of the particles of the cord. So I'm going to write down that equation. That's the key part that I need. And then I'm going to write down what they expect us to find. Today's 11.22. And this is PHY241. These are, I know you aren't looking at the page right now. I'm just uh, writing this down and I'll, because I want to give you all time to fully absorb problem 34 or 24. And uh, 
I feel inclined to change the numbers just to keep it from being a copyright violation. So I think I might do that on the fly. Uh, I'm going to say D is equal to, now I'm not going to say 0 0.22. I'm going to say uh, 0 0.50 times the sign. So I changed the 0.22 to, to uh, 0.50. Uh, the sign of, and I'm going to say 7.4x, so I didn't write 5.6x, I wrote 7.4x, plus I'm going to say 44t instead of 34t, okay? Now, I'll show you this in a second, but what I want is lambda equals question mark, I want f equals question mark, I want uh, V equals question mark. And I'll put a vector symbol over it because it wants magnitude and direction. And amplitude A equals question mark. And maximum minimal speed. So V max slash min is question mark. All right, so let me stop sharing real quick. And so I'm doing different numbers, uh, mainly because I don't want to give the answer to all any students that might be taking this because the instructor might assign it. Uh, hopefully they can still figure out how to solve the problem from my numbers and, and that that's fine. But uh, the main thing is, like I said, I, I, I think I might be going a step too far. It's bad enough that I'm showing it on, on my YouTube channel, uh, but to actually solve that very solution would be really problematic. So I'm gonna try to change it a little bit and see what we can do, okay? So what we know is I told you a solution, something like X is equal to A uh, cosine omega, uh, excuse me, KX minus omega T plus five. That was more or less the solution I gave you, right? So this is sort of similar. It's just a matter of you could have changed the five and turned the cosine into a sine, right? But at the end of the day, what you realize is uh, the 0 0.50 is actually measured in meters, and that's the A. So whatever the multiplier is of the sine or cosine is going to be the A, the amplitude. And you can see that because you can uh, basically just realize that the sine graph, if you, say, plotted it by hand or plotted on Desmos, you'd see that it just oscillates back and forth between some maximum height and some minimum height or you know some maximum distance above the axis and then some maximum negative distance below the axis so clearly that's going to be a not only that you can see that the 7.4 is k so k which equals 2 pi over lambda remember that's that might seem kind of odd to you but remember it's the exact same thing as omega being 2 pi over the period the period is the time over which the wave repeats itself and the wavelength is the distance over which the, the wave repeats itself. So those two things should help you a lot. So the K in this case is 7.4. So that means that lambda is in fact equal to two pi over 7.4. And of course the X is measured in meters. So this is gonna come out in meters as well. So if I do this, I do two pi divided by 7.4. I'm going to start by turning on my calculator. Evidently, it does not take numbers with it being off. Two times 3.14159 divided by 7.4. That gives me a wavelength of 0 0.8491. I carried two extra sig figs there, but that's the wavelength. Okay, so just remember whatever is being multiplied by K is by default, uh, or being multiplied by X is by default K. So, and whatever is being multiplied by T is by default Omega. So we now have uh, A and we have the wavelength. Of course, now we need the frequency. And I know that this quantity right here, 44 has to be Omega. So, Omega is equal to 44. And of course that has to be in radians per second because the time is in seconds. 
and all this has to come out in radians, which is not really a true unit. But the radians, of course, is two pi over the period, which you also know is two pi times F. So we can say F is equal to 44 radians per second uh, divided by two pi. So 44 divided by parentheses two times 3.14159, and I get 7.003. Uh, I can't quite see the beginning of there. It's, it's omega is 44 rads per second. Is yes. It, what? Rads per second, and then that's equal to two pi over the period. Oh, two pi over period, all right. Right, which is that's the one that I said to parallel to the K definition. That's why uh, that's why I started there, just because that's an easy mnemonic. And of course, the period is one over the frequency, so I made that two pi f. Okay. And, and this, of course, comes out in hertz because you've taken radians per second and basically converted with this two pi converted the radians to cycles. Does that make sense, to everyone? Now the velocity of the wave, uh, you might realize velocity equals frequency times wavelength. And, and you're exactly right. We could just multiply those, but there's also another neat way. I, I just think I feel compelled to show you. Uh, F is omega over two pi. And lambda is K over two pi, or excuse me, lambda is uh, two pi over K. So there's actually a way you can get the velocity without using a calculated quantity. You see here, the two pi's cancel out and you're just gonna divide omega by K. And that's called the phase velocity, really, which is really the speed at which that shape is moving, which is sort of our definition of it. So in doing that, I'm, I'm able to avoid using calculated quantities. And I'm just gonna take the uh, omega, which is 44, radians per second and i'm going to divide that by the k which is 7.4 and that's uh reciprocal meters so 44 divided by 7.4 is equal to 5.946 uh meters per second so we know that that's the actual velocity or the magnitude. Now, the fact that this is kx plus omega t tells you that this is actually moving in the negative direction. Again, I want to reiterate why that's the case. In fact, uh, I made it through three semesters of this course without, without figuring out a good way to make sense of kx plus omega t. Uh, going to the negative and kx minus omega t going in the positive direction. Uh, at, shortly thereafter, I figured this out when I thought about this thing being called the phase, whatever's inside there is called the phase. And then I sort of linked that with, oh, that's that shape right there. And then I was like, oh, okay, well, that shape right there is obeying, you know, it has a position x at every time t. So what I ended up doing is say, let's, let's let 7.4x plus 44t be a constant. And let's say that constant be one, say. Okay, you don't have to choose a particular constant. I just chose to choose one. Okay, actually, let's let's call that two pi. That'd be a better, better constant. That way, you know, it's sort of something that works with the uh, trig function in the radian mode. Okay, so when I do that, what I see is if I solve this for x, I get uh, x is equal to two pi minus 44 T over 7.4. And I think you see that is a linear function of T. In other words, I could write it as negative 44 over 7.4 T plus two pi over 7.4. So basically what we're seeing here 
is at t equals zero, it is two pi over 7.4, but its slope is basically uh, negative 44 over 7.4. So it's gonna be a negative slope like this. And you see that in time, clearly, uh, this is X and this is C. Clearly this thing is going backwards in time. The X is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and going in back to the negative X over time. So yes, it is, it is going in there. You, you don't have to do this graphing part. In some cases, people might even find that more confusing. The main part is to see this. Look, as time gets larger and larger, this gets more negative and negative. So yeah, it has to be going in the negative direction. You can also compare by multiplying uh, velocity times wavelength. So I'll do that real quick just to see that we don't that we also get uh, five point nine four six. So I take the uh, point eight four nine and I multiply that by the seven point zero 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 two eight, and I get five point nine four six again. So that does in fact give me the same answer no matter which way I do it. So now I've done everything but but the Vmax and min. Okay. Does anybody recall how we might get what the Vmax is? Let's say this D. You know, we, we normally call it X, but your book chose to call it D this time. It really is just X. How would you get the velocity if you have X as a function of time? Chat it if you like. How are you gonna get the velocity as a function of time if you have the position X or D as a function of time? Very good, Patrick. So yes, V is equal to dx dt. And you might not remember what that result was. I will tell you that basically when you take the derivative of a cosine or a sine, you're going to get the other function plus or minus, and you're going to have to then do the uh, chain rule uh, and, or excuse me, the, uh, the, yeah, the chain rule, and basically have to then take the derivative of all this with respect to time. So you end up getting this omega times A, and that's your max and min uh, velocity. So really, I know already it's just going to be A times omega, which in this case is going to be 22 uh, meters per second in the positive direction is the highest, and 22 meters per second in the negative direction is the lowest, even though they're both the largest magnitude. But that being said, let me just take the derivative and show you. So when I take the derivative of sine, I know the derivative of sine is cosine. So I'm gonna say 0 0.50 meters times the derivative of sine is cosine of 7.4x plus 44. T. Now I've got to take the derivative of this with respect to time by the chain rule, and that gives me 44 radians per second. Okay, this is V max. In other words, the velocity is going to go back and forth between the positive of this value and the negative of this value because this cosine is going to go back and forth between the positive and the negative. Sir, would it be cosine? Uh, yeah, I did write cosine. Well, the the x position is cosine, and then we're deriving it. Oh, oh, it? yeah, no, I did it with the with the one the problem gave us. This was oh our, the d oh okay this gotcha. is our generic answer right. <laughs> I tried to give myself a little bit more room so I can write this a little more clearly. So radians per second. Yeah, so I was taking that, that derivative, not this one. This is our model solution. And like I said, I, what I'm trying to show you is this problem is really good, one, because it made me calculate all these different things, but two, because it uh, called it a variable other than x, which that should not throw you, and three, most importantly, 
it used a sine instead of a cosine. I don't want you flipping out when you see that. The difference between a sine and a cosine is always a, a sum of some angle. So if you you know add pi over two to one of them, you're going to get the other one. And I never remember which one until I do a graph like this and look at it and say, okay, well, this is cosine <laughs> and this is sine. And then I say, oh, okay, yeah. So I'm over by pi over two right there. Uh, so if I want cosine, I have to add to my argument plus pi over two. Or if I want to get sine, then I have to subtract pi over two. So in other words, uh, this might have been cosine minus pi over two, and we just took out that part and made it into a sine. Okay. So the V max either way is going to be 22.00 extra sig figs, of course, meters per second. And the V min, again, I don't like this wording because it, it leads to conceptual issues that I think are problematic. Uh, generally speaking, the V min in, in sinusoidal type motion is what happens when you're going in the negative direction, even though we know physically the minimum velocity is uh, our speed even is the lowest it gets. And obviously that would be zero. But in, in this context, that's, that's normally what they mean when they talk about max and min. So this is going to oscillate back and forth between the max and min velocity. Any questions on that problem? So we call that example one. I think that was pretty, pretty straightforward, but it looks a little scary when you first see it. I, I know students often they say, like, I don't know any of this. What are you talking about? Well, yeah, it's just that. Okay. It's just that this is a amplitude. That's got to be an amplitude because sine and cosine act the same way. They, they hovel back and forth or hover back and forth in, in front and between two extremes, one and negative one. But if you multiply them by 0.5, then they uh, basically hover back and forth uh, between two extremes of 0.5 and negative 0.5. All right, so that's one of the problems I wanted to show you. Uh, another one was, I really like a problem on here. Uh, in fact, I started making a spreadsheet uh, answer to it just for fun. I'm going to look on page 423 real quick. Let me show you that. This is a, a nice problem. So we're on like page 419 right now. I'm going to uh, go ahead a couple pages and show you something that you might want to try. I, like I said, I'm going to do it in a second. Uh, it's not that one. This one's actually neat, but you know, you can tell what I taught you is to be able to handle something like this. Oh, yeah, and this one shows more or less what I was just talking about, uh, only in this case, they happen to use a phi equals zero. Okay, so at the top of this page should be the one. No, nope. maybe it's the next page. That 51 there, I'm going to come back and do that in a second. Where'd the problem go? Dang it. That's 422 on page. Oh, it's 423. Dope. One more. Okay, so this is this is what I'm talking about right here. It says two wave pulses are traveling in opposite directions at the same speed of 7.0 centimeters per second. Uh, at t equals zero, the leading edge of the two pulses are 15 centimeters apart. Sketch the pulse at t equal one, t equal two, t equal three. So what they're doing is they're saying, okay, this is 15 centimeters apart. They're moving at seven centimeters per second. So after one second, this one's gonna be seven centimeters closer and this one's gonna be seven centimeters closer. The sum of those is 14, so that means they're one centimeter apart. Then at two seconds, this one's going to have moved over to, uh, instead of, uh, what, 23, it's going to move over to 16. And this one's going to move, instead of moving from, uh, instead of being at 17, it's now going to be moved at 34 or 24. Yeah, 24. And all you're doing is going to add the Y values of them. So I started to set up a spreadsheet. Let me stop sharing this one real quick. Uh, I started setting up a spreadsheet, and this is a neat way you can do it. Uh, I put X's here. Notice what I did for, uh, for the X values. I just did add 0.05 centimeters 
for each one. That means I'm really, really dense. I could have done it and left it just 0.1. So it goes 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, But I wanted a little bit more fine grain. That made you go up to like 300 lines so I could get to 15 centimeters. And what I was going to do is say, screw that. The, the uninteresting part is that whole first second does nothing, right? So I was going to start the two waves as if they had uh, the two leading edges touching at t equals zero seconds. And then I would make a, a Y1, a Y2. And all I'd really do is make a sine function or a cosine function. So if you look at, let me switch screens again. If you look at this, it's not really a sine wave, but it sort of is. So you can just say, okay, well, they look about the same height, but this one's wider, which means it has a larger period, right? So that means it's going to have a, uh, or excuse me, a longer wavelength because uh, we're looking in space now, not in time. So it'll have a larger wavelength. So you just basically use a smaller K value and they both have the same amplitude and you only allow it to run between, of course, what I would have called zero and 15 or 10 centimeters. And this one would be one with a larger K value uh, because we want a smaller wavelength. And it would only run from, uh, let's say, 10 to 15. So that way they'd be right on top of each other. And then you could just uh, change the time by that little bit of uh, interval that I was suggesting, maybe 0.1, or actually in this case, they're actually whole, asking for whole seconds. But I'd maybe do quarter seconds. And then you just add them up and make the graph, uh, several graphs of these heights added together over time. And you see exactly how this leading edge adds with this leading edge. And then when the peaks line up, you'll get sort of an extra bump right here where these two are adding because it's only five wide. But the other part out here, the other, uh, since this is only 10, this is the other two and a half, or excuse me, yeah, two and a half on each side centimeters. Uh, that's going to look just plain like the normal thing. So that's something that I definitely recommend you doing or even just doing it like I did in class where I lined them up and, and uh, added the amplitudes at each individual point. So that's some of the stuff that's really fun to do. Uh, if, you, if you write code, these things are really fun to do as well. Uh, but I'm not going to assign them. I just think, you know, if, if you guys are taking, you know, C++ right now for engineering or uh, maybe even Fortran, I don't think to me, Fortran was the language for engineers, but I don't think many people are using it anymore. So uh, it would be a really nice little ex uh, exercise for you to write code with these types of problems. This is a good problem. Let's do uh, 51 right quick. So this one says, show that the frequency of a standing wave on a chord of length L and linear density mu which is stretched to attention FT is given by this, where N is an integer. Okay, so uh, y'all can see that uh, we want to get, this is gonna be example two. Uh, and they're saying uh, F is equal to N over two L times the square root of FT, they call the tension over mu. So they want us to show that. I'm going to stop sharing, go back to my piece of paper. So what they're wanting you to do is show that. And what they're talking about is a standing wave on a string. So the way the standing waves on a string work is basically you send out a wave at exactly the right time so that the constructive and destructive interference forms uh, an alternating pattern of a flat line. And in the, in the first harmonic case, this and then it comes back to this so really sort of you can think of it right now as this is a wave going to the right and it reflects on the stiff wall and when it does so then basically this negative wave going backwards will start forming and coming back this way. And then when it just lines up perfectly with the next positive wave going this way, you get the flat line. And then it, that cycle repeats itself. But when you look at this, you see that the length L is actually equal to lambda over two, because remember lambda can be represented basically by the, the sine wave, right? So clearly that's from here to here, that's lambda over two. Okay. Now this is, this is not necessarily like the, the author wanted you to do. 
uh, which makes me feel better because, like I said, I'm trying not to copyright infringe or anything weird like that. But in this case, what's going to happen is you're going to have a wave, uh, let's say, going to the right, or excuse me, going to the left, like that. Okay, so maybe this is the wave. You, that would obviously be the negative sine wave. Uh, that's the equivalent of negative sine. It's going to the left. And again, just as it hits on this side, then this thing flips it upside down and makes it become this wave. And then when the peaks line up with the troughs and the, and the peaks line up with the troughs, you get that flat line in between them. In this case, you get L is equal to uh, one lambda, which you can interpret as two over two. In the third case, and I think this is enough to show the pattern well enough, uh, you get basically a wave going this way, a wave going, it's still going to the right. Only in this case, just as the first wave gets to this end, a second, a second wave has made it a half the way through there. So this one's going to flip upside down. And at that instant that the crest line up with the troughs and the troughs line up with the crest, you get that flat line again. In this case, you can see this is uh, one and a half lambda. So L is going to be equal to three lambda over two. I think the pattern is obvious now. L is going to equal N times lambda over two for n equals one, two, dot, dot, dot. That means you can solve, oh, and your book's calling it script L, so I should change this to script L, I guess. Okay, now you can solve for lambda and say that lambda is in fact equal to, and I'm solving this one, lambda is in fact equal to two L over n, And we know that velocity equals frequency times wavelength. So I can say, well, the velocity of a wave on a string is the square root of the tension. Actually, I'll fix it this way. The square root of the tension divided by the mass per unit length. And I'd say that's equal to the frequency times the wavelength. But our late wavelength we just found was 2L over N. So I can now solve for the frequency and see that the frequency is actually equal to N over 2L times the square root of the tension over mu. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? No questions? All right, so notice that expression. It says the frequency is directly related to the tension. Of course, it's the tension to the one half power. So in order to double the frequency, you have to multiply the, uh, the tension by a factor of four. And it's inversely related to the mass per unit length. Again, but it's to the square root. So if you wanted to cut the frequency in half, you'd have to uh, increase the mass per unit length by a factor of four. But still, that's, that's something that's helpful. Well, in some sense, it's helpful. It was helpful for me because I don't take anything at face value, and uh, I don't trust that I've observed all phenomena uh, judiciously. So just me learning by doing one thing and seeing that it gets this response, that doesn't. that's not always enough for me to... Uh, conclude that that's the way it's always going to be. I just don't trust uh, the time unless I take the time to do multiple, multiple, multiple experiments and do all the trials. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now show you something. Uh, so notice the frequency is was uh, directly related to the tension. Okay, so here's my banjo, all right? So I've got these banjo strings and you can look, it's hard to see, but the ones that are actually easy to see, like uh, maybe, excuse me, that one right there, or excuse me, this one right here, you can see that really well because that's a fat sucker. In other words, this mass per unit length is pretty high. And listen to it. That sounds kind of low, right? This little drone string on the side is actually the thinnest. Now this one over here is pretty thin too. 
but you can see right here that that's a little bit darker or a little bit deeper than the other one okay so that is a, a stringed instrument and that's actually the strings that you're seeing here and it was sort of horrible. My first instrument that I've, I haven't had any lessons with the banjo, but I have had lessons with the violin, which oddly enough, I was stupid enough to think because it only had four strings, it'd be easier than, than a guitar. So I took uh, violin lessons. Oh God, that was a hard instrument. It was terrible. It doesn't have frets. You got to, oh, it's just awful. But anyways, it was so terrible because I'm sitting here taking lessons and she said, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a little, uh, what she call it? That's a little, uh, she didn't say pitchy. She said, that's that's a little high or something like that. So I immediately had to take my physics brain and say, okay, it's the frequency is too high. Uh, uh, okay, and then I had to measure it. Well, is it, you know, that I'm fingering it in the wrong position because that's one time when she'll say the, the frequency is a little too high. Uh, and then I got to correct for that. Or the other time is I'm first tuning my violin and I got to correct for that. So if, if I were told, for instance, that one's too high and i'm plucking this string right here okay i would say okay the frequency is too high i want the frequency to be lower therefore i have to loosen the string so i'd go up here find out which one of these knobs controls this string and it's this one right here and then i'd have to remember which way it uh turns to loosen and i'd loosen it up and that would of course lower the frequency the other thing i'd do of course and she say, no, you're a little high, meaning again, high pitch. And that's when I'm playing the instrument. In her case, it was the violin. But in that case, if I say I'm a little high, then maybe I need to go, what, to this one? Or do I need to go with no fret at all? Well, that's sort of a backwards calculation because from here to here is the length of the string. If, if I, my frequency is too high, that means my wavelength is too low right because the velocity of the wave is a fixed thing once you've got it tuned to whatever you want it to be the velocity is fixed because you're not going to change the mass per unit length and you're not going to change the tension not appreciably you just by putting your finger on it right so since the velocity is fixed that means if frequency goes up then uh, wavelength has to go down by the exact same amount so if she said my frequency was a little high i'd say oh, okay well i need my wavelength to go a little higher which means guess what the wavelength is the length from here to wherever my finger frets it within a factor of two, three, four, five, six, or whatever. But in the first harmonic, it's a factor of one half because the wavelength is uh, twice the length of this. But still, I would know. Hey, if if this did, if this sounded, if this sounded too low pitch, oh, I need to move it up here. And that sounded backwards, so I probably said it backwards. But either way, you, you see the point is this kind of uh, physics can tell you how to do it. Now, it's, it's horrible because I was the slowest violin player ever, and they just said, you said, no, you just, you're just you used to it. Just just do it from your memory. I'm like, no, I can't do that. I got it. So every time I'd stop and think, I'd put my finger on the on the board of the band, of the uh, violin, and I'd, and it sounded like I was strangling poor little kittens, as my daughter said. And then I'd move my finger accordingly using the laws of physics. So it does work. But that's not the way you want to do it if you're a musician. Uh, you want to trust your ears. I don't trust my ears. Uh, basically, they failed me when they let go of all my hair. So, <laughs> so that's a real life application, if you will, of dealing with uh, waves on a string, standing waves is what they're called, stuff like that. Any questions on that? So, oh, yeah. Did y'all see? I got a new baby Yoda. He's cooler. That's the old one. But this one, look how cute. You don't have those creepy orange toenails and fingernails either. And he's got no legs, so that makes him cute. All right. So let's stop this. Now, the next problem I want to do, let's look in here. Uh, I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, you might recognize this right here. This is one of the labs that we skipped. Remember, the oscillating string was one of the uh, things that you did with the laser and the, or did y'all even do the laser and the, and the, I can't remember if that's uh, uh, the 242 or 241. Uh, anyways, in 242, you'll do, the, do it if you didn't do it already. Uh, but this is basically a wave on a string. If you have a mass hanging over here, then the tension's already mg. 
and you can already sell what the length is. In fact, let's go ahead and do this problem. I wasn't going to, but I think I will now. I like it. So this is example three. Okay, it says one end of a horizontal string of linear density, so that's mass per unit length. So I'm gonna write down mu is equal to, notice the units, that's one of the cues. That's one of the things that told me what that was. I might not know the word linear density because Mr. Younger not, has not once used the word linear density uh, for mu. Uh, we did when we were talking about integrating uh, rods and stuff like that, but we didn't use it in this context at all. So you might have been confused by that. But it does say kilograms per meter. So, you know, oh, that looks like the mu that Mr. Younger was telling us about. So it's 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative four kilograms per meter. I'm probably going to change that number just so uh, maybe I won't be so bad to other teachers using this book. And it's attached to, to a small amplitude mechanical oscillator that oscillates at 120 hertz. So F is equal to 120 hertz. Like so. The string passes over a pulley uh, over a distance L equals 1.50 meters uh, away and weights are hung from this end. What mass M must be hung from the end of the loop to produce one loop, two loops, five loops? Oh, this is excellent. I love this problem. So M equals question mark for A, one loop, B, two loops, C, five loops, uh, assume the string at the oscillator is a node, which is nearly true. Yeah, so you're actually, notice the oscillator is doing the actual swinging right here. But if you've actually done one of these things before, you'll notice that um, within like a half a centimeter away, there will be an anti-node. I mean, be an, a, an actual node. So we're just assuming basically probably they measured from the node to the node as opposed to from the edge of the oscillator. Uh, so that's no big deal. So that's the problem I'm going to solve. I'm going to find out basically what must M be. So how can we do that? That sounds pretty complicated, but it's actually not too bad. So first off, let me change these numbers because I don't want to solve this and ruin it for some other instructor trying to solve, uh, uh, assign this even numbered problem for a homework. So instead of 6.6, .6, I'm going to say this is an even 9.0 times 10 to the negative fourth kilograms per meter. Okay, so I'm just going to erase that 6.6 .6 and say this is our mu. I'm going to stick with the 120 hertz because that's a pretty typical value. And I'm going to change the L to three meters. So the L is going to be three meters. So now I've written all this down. Uh, Y'all can take a screenshot if you want so you don't have to write yourself. But I, I highly encourage you writing all these things in real time because that's really part of the muscle memory stuff that helps you learn a little bit more, believe it or not, even though it's muscle memory for writing. Uh, so what we're looking at again is this is the the instance in which you have one loop remember when i showed you where uh l is equal to lambda over two well we know velocity of the wave is equal to the square root of mg over mu right but the velocity of the wave has to be equal to the frequency times the wavelength well, the wavelength for two loop, I mean, for one loop, that's what they asked for first was one loop. The wavelength for one loop is L over two. So I can say square root MG over mu is equal to F times L over two. And lo and behold, I square both sides. I get MG over mu equals F squared, L squared over four. So M better be equal to, uh, let's say, mu F squared L squared, make sure I'm writing this out of the page still, over G times, over 4G. Okay, that's the actual answer. And you can probably guess what's going to happen for the other loops. But all I have to do now is put in those numbers. And when I put them in, I'm using 9.0 times 10 to the negative fourth. 
9e negative 4 times 120 squared times 3 squared. Remember, I'm, I changed my uh, length, so I wouldn't be doing exactly the problem. And then I'm going to divide that by 4 times 9.8. So I use parentheses 4 times 9.8. And I get the mass should be 2.975. Actually, it's 2.976 uh, kilograms. It's 755, so I really should have rounded this to six instead of calling it five. So that's for one loop. Of course, you can see for the two loops, then L is equal to two lambda over two. So lambda is just equal to L. So what you're gonna get for, that's part A. For part B, what you're gonna get is M is equal to mu F squared L squared over, instead of two, there's gonna be a one there. So it's over G. So in fact, you see that the mass is gonna be four times as large. So all I gotta really do is multiply this by four and I get 11.902. Two, and actually I'm only using two sig figs, so I did three that time. Uh, kilograms for two loops. And C, you can see uh, in that case, they want five loops. So that'd be one, two, three, four, five, like so. So those five loops, notice this is a wavelength. This is a wavelength. So this is actually one, two, three, uh, two and a half wavelengths, which is five halves. So L is equal to five lambda over two. So in this case, we're going to say lambda is equal to two fifths L. Sorry, I switched back to using capital L. So lambda is going to be two fifths L. Uh, so when I put in the L over two, that's what went there. So in this case, I'm going to put a two and a five. Notice the two and five are both, both going to be squared. So now I have M equals four mu F squared L squared over 25 G. So in this case, I'm going to take, uh, I might as well just calculate it. I'm going to say four times nine e to the negative four times 120 times 120 times three times three. So that's everything squared. Now I'm gonna divide it by parentheses 25 times 9.8. And in this case, I get 1.90. One point nine zero. Oh, that's what it was. Got you. One point nine zero two kilograms. This seems weird. I don't know what happened uh, because we clearly went up to the second one, but we we went back down. I'm trying to see if I made a mistake. Four times nine e to the negative fourth. Let's see what I did before. Nine times the negative fourth. One twenty times thirty. And divide by four from number one eight. Okay, that, that all looks right. Uh, it's weird. I did not expect it to go up and then back down. Uh, but if you actually did this in terms of N, that might make some sense because uh, we know L is equal to uh, N lambda over two. So lambda is going to be uh, 2L over N. And when I put that in there, I get square root mg over mu is equal to f times 2l over n. So yeah, that's sort of a complicated function because when we it's actually over, over uh, n squared because we're going to square all this and that's going to give us mg over mu is equal to 4 
writing in the small part of the paper here, sorry. It's going to give me uh, four. The paper moving is certainly not helping. F squared, L squared over N squared. So yeah, I can see where the first one, we went from N equal one to N equal two, they just canceled out, but then N equal, uh, you know, five halves, well, in with two equaling, equaling two fifths could be a problem. So yeah, I guess that makes some sense. But anyways, that's how you do that problem. Anybody have any questions on that one? I should really circle these answers, make sure they're easy to see. Uh, could you zoom in on some of those uh, formulas that you were using to get to uh, the answer for A? Uh, yes. So let me do this and then I'll focus a little better. So velocity is root. Square root of mg over mu. Yeah. Because it's the tension in the rope and with it, one side hanging, the tension is just the, the weight mg. And then I set that uh, because lambda uh, ended up being equal to two uh, L over two. Oh, wait a second. Uh, mm -hmm. That might have been the problem. Notice this. Uh, I said L is equal to lambda over two. So then ah, that's what went wrong. So this one's the funny one. Y'all see what I did? I, I, I solved for lambda. But I actually had solved for L and I put in L for lambda instead of two. I put L over two. It should be two times L. So that's the that's the error. So it should be this one should have been uh, like that has a four. So you gotta see that mistake. It's just a it's just an algebra mistake, but still it's a mistake and that causes a problem. So this one I'll go ahead and write the right answer. Uh, and y'all probably didn't catch it because it was blurry. I didn't realize it was that blurry that y'all couldn't read this, but I'm going to multiply 2.976. That makes a lot more sense. Now it looks like it uh, could actually be uh, more reasonable. Like it's going to start with a high mass and, and stay and get lower. So uh, let's say I'm going to multiply that by 16 because notice I had divided by four and I should have multiplied by four. So I'm going to multiply this number by 16 and that should get it. So I'll say times 16 and it's, oh yeah, 47.61. Okay. I'll write no here as well. So yeah, that, that's the problem. Now, you, wait a second, y'all can't see a thing there. Okay, so basically, I made a mistake in solving for lambda. For some reason, I put L over two there instead of two uh, L. So this should have been two, and this should have been four up here. And now we get back to my original formula, which is what I should have done to begin with is work it out numerically. So that would have been a four there. The four would have just canceled out here. And then the four on the top would be there, but it'd be divided by 25. So that makes a lot more sense. That was bothering me that I seemingly went from a low mass to a high mass and then back to a lower mass. Normally you'd expect that even with the N squared being in the denominator, as the N got larger and larger, you expect the uh, weight to get smaller and smaller. Crap, now time's up. Well, that's okay. That's, uh, that's pretty much all the types of problems I really want to make sure you knew. Uh, I would recommend you trying that number 90. And there was another one I thought about doing that uh, I think is worthwhile. And maybe it was number, yeah, it was probably number 22. That was one of the good ones. So try 90 and 22 on your own. You guys are free to go, of course. I'm writing here number 90 and number 22 on pages 419. And then the other one was page 423. So I recommend you doing those just for uh, extra practice, but I, I think I've covered everything that I really wanted you guys to, 
to see. Uh, there's a lot more problems that can be solved with these. There's a lot of ways you can uh, put these in everyday life uh, and stuff like that. But I think this covers the crux of, of what I think is most important. So like I said, you guys are free to go. I, I hope you have a great Thanksgiving. Remember, you don't have to come back until a week from today. Uh, we don't have lab this week either uh, because all our labs, all my labs start Wednesday. So I don't have anything uh, Wednesday, Thursday or Friday, which is where my labs would be. So all you guys are off, of course, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Have a good Thanksgiving or whatever holiday you want, might be celebrating, and uh, see you guys. Stay safe. Stick around if you have any questions. i got plenty of time before my next class. Hey, Professor. I actually like some ho help on um, Chapter 14 homework. Just one question. I was having some okay. difficulties. No with. problem. Let me make it so you can share the screen. Okay. Now you should be able to share screen. Okay, this was one big hot mess. Okay, a solid uniform disc of mass M and radius A may be rotated about any axis parallel to the disc at variable distances from the center of the disc. Okay, what is ICM, the moment of inertia about the center? You said MA squared, one half MA squared, that's right. If you use the yeah. disc as a pendulum bob, that is, uh, what is the period as a function of distance? Okay, so uh, in this case, remember we are gonna use our torque equation. So the summation of the torques is equal to I times alpha, where alpha is the angular acceleration d2 theta over dt squared. Uh, can, I, can I watch you write it yeah. down? Do you have yeah. a piece of paper? Yeah, yeah no problem. To visualize. So, so let's look at this. Uh, the parallel axis theorem is what we're using. And this is almost the exact replica of the problem I solved for you. So that might help you as well. Uh, there's the radius A. Now, if it was rotating about there, the moment of inertia, which is about the center of mass or that, would just be one half M A squared. But in this case, you've got a string attached to it right here. And I assume the string, did they give us a distance from the center of the thing to the axis or did they give it from the edge of the pendulum to the, to the axis or what? Do you recall? I think it's the edge. All they said was A. Okay. So A is there, but did they give us another length for the length of the pendulum? Let's see. No, just A and D. If the axis is a distance D from the center. Okay. So they're saying distance oh, yeah. D from here. Gotcha. To the radial or whatever. Yep. So that's actually kind of convenient because the parallel axis theorem says uh, I about a parallel axis is equal to I, uh, the one half MA squared, which is just the moment of inertia about the center of mass, plus M times D squared, where D is the distance from the center of mass to the new axis of rotation. So that's the moment. Oh, so that would be the distance? Yeah, yeah. It's just the distance from the normal axis that this was calculated with to the new axis, which is way to Cooper Bear. Now we say the summation of the torques is equal to I d2 theta over dt squared. We know I, of course, the torque, we're treating this body uh, as a, an object of length L. We have a force M g acting on it uh that force can cause a torque but remember torque is uh, one way of writing torque is the component of, of the force perpendicular to the lever arm so that's this component right here you'll notice if this is the angle theta then so is this so this part right here is mg sine theta and that is in fact equal to uh, F perp. Okay. So this side becomes M G D sine theta. That's the torque is equal to one half M a squared plus, uh, M D squared. D squared times D two theta over D T squared. Now all you have to do is, uh, relate that to the differential equation so you can see what the omega is and then they can give you the period. So uh, what we normally do is we divide everything 
that's multiplied by the second derivative, we divide by that across everywhere. And uh, actually, this should be negative, by the way. Sorry about that. Uh, and then this would be it's plus. What's that now? It's going down. Yeah, uh, well, it's basically because uh, as theta gets goes up, this force points that way. So it's more or less because it's the opposite direction of the theta. And we, okay. make, we make the small angle approximation, which says sine theta is approximately equal to theta. So I'm going to get MGD over one half MA squared plus MD squared times theta is equal to zero. So the square root of that is omega. Okay, and that M is the same M as this one. Sorry about that. Okay, so is that what it's looking for, though? Well, remember, omega is also equal to bomb? 2 pi over the period. So they're, what they're asking for is the period. So once you do this, you're going to say T is equal to 2 pi over the square root of all that stuff, because that's what omega is. You could see it's G D over 1 half a squared plus d squared. So obviously you probably okay. want to flip that over and then say the whole thing is two pi on the square root of one half a squared plus d squared over gd. So my answer was similar to that and I got it wrong. So let me try that again. Um, if anybody else has a question, they can go. Okay, anybody else? Jonas, Paul, Randall? Can you hear me, Professor? Yes. So, um, as you may have realized on test four, you reopened it for me. I mean, right. test test three, you reopened it for me. But I wanted to double check again. Um, I actually had taken it so that when you opened it up again, I decided not to because of integrity. I didn't, I didn't oh, want gotcha. to be like that. Was but, I supposed um, to open three, but I opened four by mistake? No, you opened three because I had thought that I, I was missing test three, but as I looked at it again, it was actually there for me. Oh, okay, I checked gotcha. on, the, on the link. But um, for test five, it was due on November 17th on one, last Wednesday, but I wasn't able to take it because I, I was taking the U.S. Army competition, which which made me, um I was out of state for it. Um, I just came back um on Sunday, actually, yesterday. Um, I was wondering if you could reopen that for me because yeah, uh, but always let me know ahead of time when you have something like that uh, that you're going to do that that makes it a little easier. And now I've yes. got to you know, consider what what I well what I'm going to do. But yeah, I'll go ahead and open it up for you. So you knock it out if you don't mind. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank no you problem. Go get it done before you go to a holiday. Okay. Yes, of course. You have a wonderful Thanksgiving, Professor. You too. Thanks, Paul. How about you, Jonas? Is this um, awful? Do you pronounce it pilapil? I said pillow pill, but pillow pill. I, said, fine. I think I like pillow pill better than pilapil. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds um, like a food item when you say pilapil. <laughs> yeah. So I had the same problem as Paul. You missed just have? Yeah, because I had like family emergency all week last week. So no I was problem. In, yeah. I'll go ahead and take care of that birth, y'all. Okay. Thank you so much. No problem. It's right, have, crap hard. I try to make them um, up for it by letting people, you know, have a little boo boo every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, okay. You, <laughs> All right. Have a good day. You too. Hey, Mary, did, did that work for you? Yeah, it did. Now I'm just finishing up part D. I just wanted to get all my extra credit points. I know I need them. Gotcha. Um, so here I was looking up. So the minimum, I think I'm right for this one either. Okay, so, so this one was correct. Okay. And this is just asking for the minimum period of the pendulum. Uh, what is human? Okay, so they're seeing that as a function of D. In other words, what they're wanting you to do is figure out, okay, I have a period as a function of D. Uh, what what value of D gives me an extrema for that period? Zero. 
Uh, but zero would actually make it uh, really problematic because you'd have a zero in the denominator. Uh, so that can't be that. So do you remember how to find extrema? Mm -mm. Uh, from calculus, how do you find the maxima or minima? Oh, I failed calculus three this semester. So <laughs> well, I wish I did. Trust me, I know I'm going to have to work like three times as hard now just to get this degree. But <laughs> yeah, well, that happens. Don't worry about that. But the main thing here is uh, we learned in the first semester that, uh, and, and this is the model function I use. Remember y equals x squared? You can probably draw that graph. Let's see, yes. You go zero, zero. Yeah, sorry. Uh, zero, zero. And then you go one, one. That means if you go to the left one, you go up one. If you go to the right one, you go up one. And then you go to two, two. If you go to the left two, you go up four. So this is one, two, three. Oh, making four. like a parabola? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right? So that's sort of my model function that I go to. And this helps me figure out everything. And by that, I mean, I recalled that finding the minima or maxima or the more generally the term is extrema, I set dy over dx equal to zero. So if I take the derivative of y with respect to x, I get two x. So that means two x is equal to zero. So x equals zero and you find, yeah, mm -hmm. that's in fact. The minimum would be zero. at It's a minimum. Zero. Now, the other part is finding out whether it's a minimum or maximum. We are fortunate enough to have a nice graph here. We can tell clearly that's a minimum. But the other part is the second derivative. And that is the second derivative of y with respect to x must be greater than zero for a minimum. Can you scoot your paper up just a little oh, bit? Thank sure. you. Uh, I'll have a big screen. So yeah, <laughs> for, uh, for a minimum, the second derivative has to be greater than zero at that point. So I'll say at x equals zero. If it's greater than zero, then it's a minima. If it's less than zero, it's a maxima. And if it's zero again, it's a, a, a point of inflection. Okay, so that's where the it changes. Right. So like the, whatever the top of a sine curve as an example would be a point of inflection. Yeah. Or actually, it's sort of the midline of the sign, but yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Because it's when it changes from decreasing to increasing. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're wanting to do. They want you to take the derivative of that ugly sucker instead of equal to zero. Well, ain't that fun? You can actually graph it in Desmos to give you a, a clue as to what the minimum should be. That's a fun trick. Yeah, I might try that out then. Also, actually, let me check super fast because I know I have you for my lab. No, no, I'm not doing the hottest in lab. I still have a couple of things missing. All of it I'm going to get to Wednesday, of course, because I don't like to waste your time. Um, so you said that we're not meeting though Wednesday, right? Because that's right. when break starting. Yeah, class, no classes on Wednesday. Okay, because I checked and it said like lab 12 attendance. And even though we don't have class on Wednesday, obviously um, everything's due still on Wednesday, I, like the last lab. Be a, I thought I went in and made them all do the Wednesday after Thanksgiving, but you might have saw, when did you look at that? Oh, I just looked at it like today. It oh, said, okay. it said but, lab yeah. 12 attendance. Oh, if it's, if it's on the attendance grade, that might have it, but I never paid any attention to that on the attendance grade. It's, uh, but in the turn-in grade for, for the lab report, that should be due uh, Wednesday when we return, which will be what, the 23rd, the 30th. And that's the one we just did last time. Right. Last week, okay. Yeah. okay. And, and, and the previous one uh, in one of my classes, maybe it's, no, I don't think it was yours, but one of my classes, the uh, both labs are due on that date, but I think it's a different class. Okay. So, okay, thank you, Professor. Yeah, no, honesty is the best policy. Unfortunately, I do have, I think, three labs I have to do. Well, get them in like, uh, <laughs> before I create them so I don't have to take off points. I, I you know, I, I take off points for just being late, but, uh, I, I take off, you know, more for the longer you are, but I can take off the minimum if you get it in before I grade it. Yes, uh, I will definitely get that to you. Because I, I, I think mine's been a little two. bit slower on, which of course, you know, same thing. I don't really care to each their own time. But I don't yeah. think I've gotten my lab three or four graded 
No. The air no, propagation no. one I owe you. Um, and the projectile one I owe you. Oh, and then the springs. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Well, thank you, Professor. I just want to get all my eggs in one basket. No problem. So uh, what, uh, one thing I want to remind you is I, on my YouTube channel this weekend, I did put up uh, the introduction to the last two labs. Uh, I might have I might have did it for 241 and 242, but I know I at least put up the last lab for 241. So if you need the introduction to see over again when you have any problems doing it over the break, then you can check that video out. Okay. Thank right. you actually for that. For sure. So I know it's not a big in there. No problem. But I hope you have a good rest of your weekend. Enjoy Thanksgiving with your family. You too. Thank you. Have a good day.